Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. The word of God today reads, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is received by the word of God and prayer. I want to add to that today, Second Timothy, I'm sorry, I said 2 Timothy earlier, didn't I? Should have said 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 reads, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a moment, if you would. Father, once again, God, we come before you today, Lord, desperately needing to hear from heaven, desperately needing, Lord, a word from you. God, I desire my entire life, my entire ministry to be a vessel that you could use. I know, God, today I'm faulty. I know, God, I'm frail. I know, Lord, today that there are much better men who are much more eloquent in their speech, much more educated, much more knowledgeable. But Lord, you have spoken to my spirit a desire to communicate this word to your people. And you've placed that responsibility this hour on my back. And Father, I can do it so long as the anointing of the Holy Ghost is present. And I ask God that you would anoint the messenger today. Help me to faithfully deliver the word of the Lord. That the people of God might be edified. That they might be enriched. That their faith today might be increased. We ask it all in that precious name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. The passage that I read to you this afternoon begins with the words Paul is writing to his young son in the faith, his apprentice, as it were, Timothy. And Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. He says, The Holy Ghost has spoken to me very succinctly and specifically on this subject. What subject? That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. My goodness, that's some powerful language, isn't it? Doctrines of devils. Doctrines that literally were hatched in hell. Speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 2 Timothy 3.13, again I read to you, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. The closer we come to the coming of the Lord, the worse it's going to get. What will be happening? Deceiving and being deceived. The Antichrist is described in the Word of God as possessing one primary trait that dominates his entire personality. And that trait is he is a deceiver. The Word of God describes Lucifer as being the deceiver of the nations. Satan himself is very crafty and very careful and very capable in the area of deception. 
He can make you think that there's water in a desert. He can make you think the sky is blue when the sky is indeed red. He can make you think that the waters are calm when quite stormy, in fact, the waters are. Here to tell you today, folks, we are living in the latter times. We are getting closer to the end of this age. And as we get closer to the end of this age, there is a growing spirit of deception that is dominating our world. And listen to me now. Sadly, it is affecting many in the church. There are too many in the church today who do not know a truth from the lie. They do not know what is right compared to what is wrong because they have allowed themselves to be deceived. You see, Satan loves to cause the church to compromise itself. He loves to cause the church to lay down its sword, the mighty word of God, and leave itself defenseless and helpless so that it might be destroyed by the works of darkness. And I'm here to tell you today, we're living in an age right now when fundamentalists and evangelical churches have allowed themselves to be deceived. They've allowed themselves to believe that right is wrong, white is black, dark is light. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. They've allowed themselves to believe that the agenda of one of the most evil men to ever walk planet Earth is an agenda that God would approve of. And it is an agenda that God detests. Amen. You do not turn your back on the poor. You do not turn your back on the stranger. When the Word of God uses the word stranger, it means literally someone who comes into your country who was not born there. That's what the biblical word stranger means. It means immigrants, literally. God was establishing the nation of Israel, and He wanted their faith to be sure. He wanted their doctrine to be pure. He wanted to be their God and their God alone. And yet... And yet, he told them, do not under any circumstances mistreat the stranger. When someone comes into your land, now Johnny, they may come from a place that believes in another God. They may come from another land that worships at a different altar. And you would think... You would think that the jealous God, Jehovah, would say to his people, Reject them! Throw them out! Don't allow them into your land! That's not what God said. He said you receive them, listen to me, and you treat them as one of your own. You treat them as though they were a natural citizen of your country. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's what the law said. We got people today who want to tell us that America is a country that is supposed to be established on Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo principle. Well, I'm here to tell you, if America were a country established on Judeo principle, Judeo-Christian principle, then the law of Moses would be our perfect model for a perfect government. Somebody said, oh preacher, that's scary because the law of Moses, homosexuals were stoned. No, they weren't. That is such a misnomer. That is such a misunderstanding of the Word of God. you got to understand the law of Moses, God also, not only did He give them rules, but He told them how those rules were to be carried out. And He said, you can't stone a woman for adultery. You can't stone a man for having intercourse with another man. And by the way, it was not homosexuals that was condemned. There was one specific sexual act. One. That's it. Ask any Jewish scholar, ask any Jewish rabbi, and he'll tell you to put uh, what the law said into 
an entire group of people is idiotic. Because God is very specific in the law. If God had wanted to classify an entire group of people, He could have and would have done so. But He did not. He said, one thing I don't want you to do. You're a new nation. You're a young nation. You need to grow. Your security, when you get into the land of promise, your security is dependent upon the number of people that you have. There is security in numbers. You've heard that old saying. You need to grow and you need to grow fast. Therefore, I don't want this sex act going on. I don't want that sex act going on. I don't want this sex act going on. Had nothing to do with it being filthy or impure or unholy or it being uh, contrary to nature. Had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the fact that it did not result in procreation because the nation of Israel had... Now, we're not going back to Garden of Eden and, you know, God saying be fruitful and multiply. But we're talking to the nation of Israel. The law was written to and for the nation of Israel. Come on, people. Let's keep things in context. It was about growing the nation so that it could be secure. If they were going to conquer Canaan, if they were going to conquer the land of promise and keep it, they had to grow numerically and they had to grow fast. And God said in the law, there was only one way to enforce any punishment within the law. So these idiots that run around saying, oh, homosexuals in the broadest sense are to be killed. They're to be stoned. That is not what the law said, not by a million miles. And every time you say it, all you do is demonstrate how stupid and ignorant you are. I'm just saying it. No, let me tell you, the law said... Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I've studied it. I've, I've studied ancient and modern Jewish scholars, Jewish rabbis and teachers, and they will tell you over and over and over again, very few people were stoned in ancient times. Very few people. Pastor, you're kidding. Why, they were supposed to run around stoning adulterers. Why, if a couple was uh, caught in the act of adultery, they were to be stoned. Um, no, it wasn't that easy. There had to be two or more physical witnesses to the act. That was what God demanded. And he did that for a reason. He did that on purpose. He didn't want people running around accusing somebody of something, you know, just so they could be killed offhandedly, you know. No, there had to be two or three physical witnesses to the act. Listen to this. The ancient rabbis, the rabbis I've studied said, even if a confession took place, there could be no conviction. Even if you walked out in the middle of the street in Jerusalem and said, I just had sex with a married woman. I'm an adulterer. The people would look at you and say, oh, you filthy, horrible thing, you. You're an adulterer. And everywhere you went, they would say, there's that adulterer. But they couldn't stone you. Because the law said there had to be two or three witnesses to the act. Secondly, you could not entrap someone. In other words, you could not set them up. Thirdly, you could not invade their privacy. So even if you knew there was a couple in the home doing something they ought not to be doing. You couldn't just barge in the house and pull them out and stone them. No. God said, if you're going to sin, you better keep it quiet. If you're going to sin, if you're going to do something I've asked you not to do, then you better keep it under wraps. We've got people in the world today still who are so hornified that if they get all worked up and jerky, they're going to go out in the middle of an alley somewhere and they're going to do the dirty deed. Am I telling the truth? Somebody online said, oh, preacher, you talk like no preacher I ever heard. Yeah, but you got my point, didn't you? You got men that will go into a park and they'll hide out in the bushes and they'll do the dirty deed. Am I telling the truth? You know what happens? You get two or three people going by who are walking or power walking or riding their bikes or riding their rollerblades or riding their skateboard, whatever they're riding, or walking their dog, and they see that going on. They're the kind of people who would be in danger of being stoned. 
because their act could be witnessed by two or three people, two or more people, without their privacy being invaded, without them being set up. Are you hearing what I'm telling you today? Because they're doing it in a place they ought not to be doing it. So what God was saying within the law was, if you're going to do things that I've told you not to do, then you better keep it well enough under tabs. You better not broadcast it. You better not do it where everybody can see it. Because if you act that way, that is not acceptable. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians rebuked the church because there was a man in the church who was bragging about having taken his father's wife. You remember the story in the book of Corinthians that Paul's writing to the Corinthians? And Paul said, and what's worse is he's bragging about it and y'all are celebrating it like it's something cool that he did. You see, if the man had done it and kept it quiet, then Paul would have nothing to say. Are you hearing what I'm telling you today? The problem is when you bring it out in the public arena and you make it something to celebrate. The Lord said, no, what I've told you to do, if you're going to do it, you do it, but you keep it quiet. If you do it, you do it, but you keep it under tabs. I want... I don't want any examples of ungodly behavior or things I've asked people not to do. I don't want any examples of that going unpunished. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So therefore, if you were caught in the act, so these foolish people run around saying gay people ought to be stoned, they ought to be killed, but oh my goodness, how foolish is that? You'd have to have two or three witnesses to the act. Got news for you, honey. I'm going to say it, and, and, and you can deal with it if you want to deal with it. You can throw up if you want to throw up. You can break into my bedroom many, 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 many nights, and you won't catch us doing nothing. Because just like any human beings, we have a, we have a habit of sleeping at night. Just like any human beings, we come home from work tired. Hello now. Johnny, I mean, you know. I disagree. Straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. I don't care if you're the, you know, the most nympho, maniac, heterosexual on the planet. That doesn't mean that every night in your bedroom, you and your wife are hanging off the chandeliers and yodeling, you know? That's right. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, so this notion that you can just run around and corral people who identify or who do certain things, that is such an ungodly, evil, wicked Notion. Jesus said, I have not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Why did, when did he say that? When James and John came to him and said, should we call down fire from heaven upon that city that would not accommodate us? And the Lord said, what manner of spirit are ye? You see... When you are operating under the notion that God is going to kill and destroy people because they don't do things the way you think they ought to be done, Jesus said you're not operating under the influence of God's Spirit. He said, I've not come to destroy men's lives. I've come to save them. So you know what that tells me, Johnny? That tells me that these people run around saying we need to crowd these people and kill them. What manner of spirit are ye? What, man, what spirit are you operating under? Because I've got news for you. It ain't the Holy Ghost. It's not the Spirit of God. Amen to that. That's right. Satan is a deceiver. The Antichrist as the true Christ is the image of the invisible God. The Antichrist is the physical image of Lucifer himself. He is the son of darkness as it were. And therefore, if Satan is a deceiver, then the Antichrist is as well a deceiver. And the Bible said he'll be able to deceive because he'll be able to lie with impunity. He'll be able to enter into agreements with people and break those agreements whenever he decides to break those agreements because he has no interest at all in integrity. He has no interest at all in doing things in a right and proper way. My, we know some people in our world today that operate like this, don't they? They'll stand there and lie to your face knowing good and well that what they're saying is not what they at all intend to do. And then they'll turn around and do the exact opposite the minute they have opportunity. In 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, the Word of God declares, But there were false prophets also among the people, 
even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Do you know what pernicious means? Pernicious means to be destroyed or destructive. It's to take a clay pot, for instance, and just throw it to the ground and it's going to shatter. So it's very destructive to follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So these false prophets among us and these false teachers are going to bring in teachings and doctrines that are damnable and many will follow them and because of them the Christian faith will be evil spoken of. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Yes. And through covetousness Shall they with feigned words, words people want to hear, make merchandise of you? What is to make merchandise? Means they literally offer you as a commodity for a price. If I'm a retailer, I put my merchandise on the shelf, you can buy that merchandise for a price. Got news for you, honey. There are TV preachers today who have a following in the millions, and they turn to the politicians and say, I'll give you my followers. I'll make sure they vote for you. Here's my price. Mm -hmm. It's not always money. I want influence. I want power. I want access to the White House. I want to be able to brag that I am the president's pastor or the president's confidant. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? But Johnny, they have made merchandise of you and I. They have made merchandise of God's people. Yes. Yes. Through covetousness. That means they want something and they want it bad whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Their day is coming. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5, the Word of God declares, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous in the Greek meaning life-threatening. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Boy, I'll tell you, I, I told... Uh, Harry and I were talking today, I said one thing about Americans today that makes me sick is how selfish Americans are. We don't want to take care of our neighbor. We don't want our neighbor's kid to go to college on our dime. We don't want our neighbor to be healthy on our dime. I'm talking Christians have this mentality. Sure do. The Word of God said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. All they want is what they want for themselves. They're not even interested in their neighbor. They don't care about their fellow American. They want to call America great when everybody is only out after their own. We're not operating as a nation. We're operating as a bunch of individuals with our own self-interests. Got news for you, honey. Abraham Lincoln quoted Jesus, A house divided against itself cannot stand. If we're not united, if we don't stand as the United States of America, every American being interested in the health, the well-being, the prosperity, the success of our neighbor, then we should not call ourselves the United States of America. But there are preachers who are preaching exactly the opposite of what I just said. I have an uncle who is a devout fundamentalist Christian, and one time I got to debating with him on, on uh, Facebook, actually. He and I began to talk about how government should operate and how things should be done. And he said, no, that's, that's God speaking to the individual Christian. That's not uh, how government should do things. And I sat there, I said, oh, really? And yet there are things that God said to individuals that you turn around and you say, oh, this should be applied as a national uh, policy. Isn't it funny how you pick and choose what God says and you decide which is what ought to be applied to 
policy as a country and what should be only applicable to the individual. And he literally claimed that things like taking care of our neighbor and feeding the poor, he said, no, that's the responsibility of the individual. The government doesn't have to. Oh, wait a minute, aren't you the one that tells me that we're a Judeo-Christian nation? Mm -hmm. Idiot. <laughs> tell me we're a Judeo-Christian nation, and then tell me in the next breath, the Word of God says, lie. What did I say earlier? I said speaking lies in hypocrisy. On one hand, they say, oh, we believe in caring for the poor. We believe in caring for the... We just don't believe our government should be doing these things. We just don't believe that our tax dollars should be going to help people. Christians ought to be the people in this country who are jumping up and saying, we support paying a little extra if it will help my neighbor's kid get through college. We support paying a little extra if it will help our neighbor's children be healthy. We support paying a little extra if it will help our neighbor to be successful. And I tell the truth today, I got news for you. The better my neighbor does, the better my house value goes up. So it helps me to help them. Hello now. Word of God said this, Know also that in the last days perilous, life-threatening time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. All they care about is their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, Incontinent, meaning without self-control. Fierce, meekness is self-control. So incontinent is the opposite of meekness. Fierce, despisers of those that are gone. Fierce means almost animalistic. They're, they're, they're just wild. They're without any constraints whatsoever. That's what fierce means. Despisers of those that are good. I hate that John McCain. I'll tell you what, that John McCain, that John McCain. John McCain spent his life serving his country. John McCain spent his entire career trying to do the right thing. And we got somebody who stands around and all he ever has to say about that man is negative, evil, rotten things. You hear what I'm telling you now? That's what you call despisers of those that are good. Traitors, needy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Having a form of godliness. Honey, there ain't no power in religion, but there is power in relationship. Hallelujah yes. to God. You will not ever experience the power of God in your life if you're adhering to rules and regulations that some denomination or somebody set forth. Oh, but come into relationship with Jesus. Hallelujah. Get to know yes. Jesus and see if the power of God doesn't break loose in your life. The closer you get to Him, the more you'll start to look like Him. Hallelujah. That's why this preacher don't preach rules and regulations. I preach relationship. I'm not trying to help you to act right. I'm trying to help you to be right. And the only way you can be right is to get to know Him better, to love Him more. Because the more you know Him, the more you love Him, the more you look like Him. Amen. Second John chapter... Excuse me, 2 John is one chapter, verses 6 through 11. And this is love, that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. What is the commandment? Jesus said, this commandment I give unto you, love ye one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The only commandment God ever gave the church was that we love. And when he said one another, he didn't mean in the church, he meant as human beings. Yes. So Paul said, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. His commandments are going to have us walking in love. Listen, for many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not 
that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. What did Jesus say? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Paul, uh, John is saying here, if you have Christ, then you have the Father as well. But if you don't have Christ, you don't even have the Father. Because the only way to the Father is through the Son, the man Jesus Christ. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Christ. He goes on to say, uh, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. You don't even say have a good day if they're preaching foolishness. For he that biddeth him good Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. That's why when Jehovah's Witnesses who do not preach the divinity of Christ come to my door and I say thank you very much, but uh, you may keep going. I don't say God bless you. I don't say have a good day. I don't say God speed. Why? Because if I do, then I'm partaking of what they're doing. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's what the Word of God said. Now listen, 1 John chapter 4. I have a point to this and I'm going to get to it. 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. I'm going to repeat that. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. I'm going to repeat that. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. You may not like our little affirm in church. You may not like our position on some issues. You may not like some of what we teach and what we believe. But honey, we declare that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Hallelujah to God. That God manifested himself in human form for the redemption of humanity. And every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Hallelujah to God. Amen. So like it or lump it, we abide by the doctrine of Christ. Yeah, right. Discerning truth in a time of deception. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. See, I, I get people all the time want to write me messages on Facebook and send me uh, letters and send me email. You're a false prophet. You're a deceiver. You're telling lies. You're preaching lies. Really? I'm going to tell you how to discern truth in a time of deception. Hallelujah. You're starting to catch on to where I'm going? I'm going to help you to understand how to discern truth in a time of deception. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. The word perfection in the Greek here literally means completion or maturity. So he said, leaving the principles 
of the doctrine of Christ. So in other words, if you're preaching the doctrine of Christ, it falls into a very specific category. He said, let us go on to perfection. Let's mature. Let's, let's go further. He said, now listen, not laying again the foundation of... So what is he saying? He's saying, now we want to go beyond the principles of the doctrine of Christ, and we want to go to maturity. What we don't want to do is we don't want to again lay the foundation. Well, now, what does this foundation consist of? Exactly what he just referred to, the, the doctrine of Christ. The principles of the doctrine of Christ. If you want to know what the true doctrine of Christ is, it ain't hard. Paul said, no, nah, we're not going to cover this all again. He said, we're going to move on to maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. What's included in the doctrine of Christ? Repentance from dead works. Hallelujah. And of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of Baptisms, plural. Water baptism in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost baptism. Hallelujah. He said, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permits. So the foundation of the church is the doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? It consists of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, plural, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. There's the doctrine of Christ. I got news for you, honey. You're sitting in a church this afternoon that preaches that very doctrine. You're sitting in a church today, we don't preach some of that, we preach all of that. Hallelujah! We're not preaching part of it! We're preaching all of it! I got news for you, honey. You may not like our position on other issues, but we're preaching the doctrine of Christ. Hallelujah! Amen. Amen. Oh, discerning truth in a time of deception. Got news for you, children. Not every affirming church today preaches what I just read. I've called affirming pastors and said, what do you believe in this issue? What do you believe on that issue? And I've literally had them say to me, uh, uh, what? Uh, uh, I don't even know what I'm talking about. You ask me about repentance, I'll tell you, nobody gets to heaven without repentance, including Donald Trump. You can't stand there and say, I've never repented because every time I do something wrong, I try to do it right the next time. That is not repentance. The Word of God said that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name. I got news for you today. The plan of salvation begins with the word repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Guess what I just gave you? I just gave you the first part of the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Listen, discerning truth in a time of deception. Jesus speaking, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree, listen, cannot bring forth evil fruit. You cannot claim the Catholic Church is part of the true Christian faith when it has a history of murder and torture and torment. Because a good tree cannot, doesn't say may not, doesn't say might not, it says a good tree cannot produce evil fruit. If it, had been, if it truly had been part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it could not have conducted itself in the way it did.
If it had been part of the true church of Jesus Christ, there would have been no crusades. If it had been part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would never have been any inquisitions. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's the truth, folks. A good tree cannot produce evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. You know what kills me? This little church has helped people find their relationship with God and restore their walk with God. And Harry, all of a sudden, we've had people experiencing blessing in their life and the Lord's been touching them and helping them. We've seen people healed. We've seen people delivered. We've seen people saved. We've seen all kinds of good things happen. We've seen all kinds of good fruit popping off of this tree. But we got people who still want to tell us we're an evil tree. Mm-hmm discerning truth in a time of deception. God, news for you. You can't get evil fruit off a good tree. Right. This yeah. tree, this tree, this church doesn't produce a bunch of whoremongers. This church, church don't produce a bunch of drug addicts. This church don't produce a bunch of people going out and acting the fool and partying around and playing games with God. Hello now. Amen. That's one reason why we got as few as we got today. Because there are other churches happy to let you act like that and conduct your hand. They don't tell you if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to be a testimony to an unsaved world. And if you look like the world and you don't stand out and you don't uh, look different than they do, then you can't possibly be light. You're as dark as they are because light and darkness don't look the same. And you are the light of the world. It's not a matter of heaven or hell. It's a matter of doing your job, and you've been called to be a witness. Hello now, you've been called to be a testimony. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. You want to discern truth in a time of deception? Look at the fruit. That's right. Now here's the thing. I love how people try to define the, the fruit. No, 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 no. What have I said to you about probably half a million times in the last 17 years? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Study to show thyself approved unto God a work on that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You gotta rightly divide this thing. So if it says good fruit, I got news for you. The Word of God also tells you what that fruit is. So don't sit here and try to tell me what fruit is. The fruit is this. Listen. Galatians 6, 19, 5, 19 through 23. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication. Fornication includes uh, child molestation, rape, incest, bestiality, and uh, prostitution, for those of you that don't know. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, em em emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. I got news for you. I did not just describe the people in this church. And I'm proud to say I didn't describe the pastor either. Harry can tell you, he knows, I've seen it. That does describe some preachers we know, doesn't it? It does. Paul continues, Galatians 5, 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Harry, I can tell you right now, the things I just described to you, some of us didn't have it before we came in here. But we've been displaying it since we got here. Hallelujah. Because it's the fruit of the Spirit. 
So when the Word of God said, you know them by their fruit, don't be looking at actions, don't be looking at words. No, no, no. What is the fruit of the Spirit? What is the fruit that is demonstrated by the work of God's Spirit in your life? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Hallelujah. Is that what the church that you hate? Is that what we're preaching? Is that what you see being produced in our church? Um, yeah. <laughs> if you look carefully at what you see produced in this little church, that's exactly what you see produced in this little church. Hallelujah. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. I'm almost, almost done. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, an immigrant, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. And I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous, what does that mean? That means those who did right. You see, if you're going to act righteous, if you're going to do right, those are the things you're going to do. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord... When saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand. Now mind you, these are people who are identified as his people. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I'm sorry, Jehovah's Witness, but hell's real. Everlasting fire. This is a fire that's never going to go out. Listen, for I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they, uh, shall, shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison? and did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as ye did it to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into, not temporary, everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You want to know how a country acts right? It feeds the hungry. Makes sure folks are hydrated. Hello now. Yes. Takes care of the sick. Takes care of those who are in prison. I got news for you. The, this nation's got one of the most hideous prison systems in the world. We treat somebody who goes to jail for a bad check the same way we treat a rapist or a murderer. The jailers will treat them the same identical way. They'll be abusive. They'll be nasty. They'll treat them horribly. If you don't go to jail evil and angry and mad at the world, you'll come out of jail evil and angry and mad at the world. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. 
Years ago, I went through a little experience where I spent eight days in a jail. I never, I was never treated so horribly in my life. Never in my life was I treated so horribly. I was there for nothing, folks. Literally, it was the most stupid little thing you ever saw. The only reason I was there eight days is because I could not for the life of me get a hold of anybody that would help me. This is what happened to me before I came out in 89. They got wind that this boy was a queer, so I couldn't get a single Christian to answer my call, answer my phone. I sat in jail for eight days, not because it was such a great crime, but because I could not get a Christian to answer my phone call. I was treated, I might as well have been a murderer. I was in a jail cell with a man who killed three people and didn't speak a lick of English. I was scared out of my mind. I was so scared. I've never been so scared in my life. And I'm going to tell you something. Those jailers were the most abusive. They were the nastiest. They were the meanest. They were the most hateful, malicious, wicked people I've ever dealt with in my life. Oh, I'm going to tell you today, folks, that's not the way we ought to be treating our people who are in jail. You don't, you don't, you don't rescue people who are on a bad path by throwing them into a cell and then verbally and emotionally and psychologically and physically abusing them day after day after day after day after day. No, that's a way to turn a bad dog into a rabbit dog. Hello now. <laughs> Finally, Matthew chapter 13, I'm trying to finish verses 24 through 30, as well as verses 36 through 43. You'll see momentarily why I divided it that way. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also, or the weeds, or the briars. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them, excuse me, let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, we jump forward to verse 36 through 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world." The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. I want to repeat that line. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom, out of the church, all things that offend, and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. 
Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to understand how to discern truth in a time of deception. Well, first of all, discerning truth is simple. Does it exalt Christ or does it diminish Christ? Does it acknowledge who Jesus is? Because when the Word of God said that you have to confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's not saying that the man Jesus Christ lived. That's not what the writer was saying, not by a million miles. He was saying, you have to confess that Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ? Jehovah's salvation, Christ, the promised one, the anointed one, the Messiah, came in the flesh. Didn't say that he lived or that he born. He came in the flesh. That means he existed before he came in the flesh. Am I telling the truth? So what he's saying is you have to acknowledge his divinity. You got to know who Jesus is. Yeah. Are they acknowledging his divinity? Do they know who Jesus is? Discerning truth in a time of deception. Mm -hmm. Because I'm here to tell you, every deception is going to try to diminish Christ. It's going to try to diminish the work of Christ. Yes. Secondly, you know truth by the fruit that is produced. Is it producing the fruit of the Spirit or is it producing the works of the flesh? Are you seeing things going on in response to that ministry? Are you seeing things going on in response to that preacher? Are you seeing things going on in response to that uh, uh, word that's being preached that are contrary to godliness? Or are you seeing what the Word of God describes as the fruit of the Spirit growing? Do you see that developing in people's lives? Do you see that happening in people's lives? Do you see people who are confused and unhappy? Do you see people who went to bed at night struggling in their mind, fearful of eternity, all of a sudden having peace? Hallelujah. And the Word of God said, it's peace that passeth all understanding. Johnny, there are some people in our community who are sleeping a whole lot better tonight because of the word they've heard this preacher preach. Because now they're walking in fellowship with the Master. Now they're to walking in fellowship with God. Because now the lie has been set aside that God do not want them and God isn't willing to have them and God isn't willing to work with them. And God doesn't want their fellowship. Hello now. And they now have joy in their life. They now have peace in their life. Am I telling the truth now? How do you know truth in a time of deception? Look at the fruit. Do you see the fruit of the Spirit? Do you see them acting right? Jesus said what right action was. You feed the poor. You feed the needy. You take care of the stranger. Are they acting like people who ought to be Christians, who are claimed to be Christians? Hello now. But I'm going to tell you another little secret. For those of you out there today who, who want to claim that this little church and this ministry, I only, folks, I want you to understand, listen, I'm not, I don't want to sound like a cult leader. I'm not trying to sound that way. I'm not saying us alone, but I'm trying to use us as an example of affirming churches in general, okay? Uh, there are people out there who want to say, oh, you people, that, that stuff you teach, that stuff you preach, of course, they ignore the fact we preach Jesus is God. They ignore the fact we preach Acts 2.38. They ignore the fact we preach Jesus' name, baptism. They ignore the fact we preach repentance. They ignore the fact we preach godly living. Hello now. They ignore all that because, after all, they're more worried about our position on this issue over here. And all of a sudden, they want to label us false prophets. But you know what? The Bible don't label us false prophets. Even if we were wrong that make us false prophets. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But here's the interesting thing. Here's a little word. Uh, the master said, let the wheat grow up with the tares. It ain't your business to root out in the church who's right and who's wrong. Amen. How do you like that? Did you hear what I said today? When T.D. Jakes made a public statement in an interview that he believed LGBT people had the right in America to establish affirming churches. People in the church came out after him like you wouldn't believe. People, preachers in the church declared him a false prophet and all they come after him because how dare he say gay people had a right 
to have a church if they believed in God and they wanted to have a church. How dare T.D. Jakes say that? And they come after him like that. I got news for you, honey. T.D. Jakes was right and you were wrong. It isn't your job to decide who's right and who's wrong. It isn't your job to tear up by the roots. Because, listen, even if we were wrong, there might be one person in this church who's right. Do you hear what I'm telling you? There might be one straight person in this church, and all the rest of us are wrong. But there might be one person in this church who is blessed and helped by this ministry, and you're tearing it up and trying to destroy it will ultimately result in their destruction as well. It's not your job to decide who's right and wrong. The Lord said, let it stay. Let them grow up together when the time comes. I will do the weeding out. I'll send my angels. They'll pull up first the tares and burn them. And then they'll gather the wheat and put it by. Isn't that what he said? See, it's God's job to judge, isn't it? It's God's job to make the final determination. Lastly, this, this afternoon, I close Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. I promise this is the last passage, Johnny. I know your stomach's growling. I know you got to meet your friends for dinner. <laughs> Paul writes and says, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, Supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, Paul said, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will Rejoice. If they're preaching Jesus, shut up and leave them alone. Can I say it any plainer? If they're exalting Jesus, shut up and leave them alone. Amen. Paul said, I don't care what their motivation is. I don't care why they're preaching Jesus, so long as Jesus is being preached. There are pastors in the affirming Pentecostal movement today, I'm going to say this, that I know for a fact, having heard from so many witnesses, it's enough to make you nauseous, who do some really nasty, ugly, ungodly things. And they have set out for the last, oh heavens, it's been like almost 20 years now, they've done nothing but go out of their way to try to destroy my reputation. One of the lies they tell is, well, he does everything we do. <laughs> oh, no, I don't. Not by a million miles. Johnny, they're trying to bid people come into their church. Every time somebody walks through the door of their church, they're trying to get them into bed. we got preachers that literally try to arrange threesomes, their spouse and them, with other people. You ain't never going to find that in this church. I don't care how hard you look. I had one guy come one time complaining that this preacher had done that to him in another church. And then this guy was trying to bait me. And when I didn't bite the bait, he left. I said, yeah, you know what? You're funny. You complained that that guy did it. The only reason you complained that he did it is you wanted to see if I was up for it too. And you found out real fast that we weren't. Tommy, you remember who I'm talking about. I'm here to tell you today, folks, there's be, but you know what's funny? They, if somebody contacts them and talks to them and says, well, I live in Dallas and I'm looking for an affirmative Pentecostal church, all they'll do is bad talk me. All they'll do is tell them all kind of wicked garbage about me. I know because I've had people call me and tell me. They said, I heard about your church six years ago, but I never came because I talked to this guy from RPI, and he said this, and I talked to that guy from RPI, and he said that. But I've been watching you online, and all I see is integrity. All I see is truth. All I see is consistency. 
See, I just keep doing what God's called me to do. I couldn't give a flying fig what, what lies they're out there spreading. <laughs> but I want to tell you folks, listen. When somebody calls me and says, I'm looking for an affirming church, a Pentecost church, and I live in this and such a city, I'll refer them to that church that has that dog of a pastor. And I'll say, just be careful. Please be careful. And if anything happens, you call me and let me know. Don't leave the church. Don't, you know, leave God. Don't jump overboard. But if anything untoward or inappropriate happens, you call me and let me know. And I'll try to help you find something else. Why do I do that? You say, Pastor, why would you do that? I'll tell you why. Because that horn doggle pig of a pastor may never make a move on this person. They may be too fat. They may be too ugly. They may be too old, whatever. And you know what? That church may wind up helping that person. That church may wind up helping that person because they don't get the bad side. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's why I refer people. I've referred people to a church in Arizona that's pastored by part of this group. And I know the pastor. I know all about the pastor. I don't like them worth a fig. But if they can be helped by that church, I know it's the only affirming apostolic church in the area, so you know. There's a church over here, a church over there. You see, it's not my job to weed, to pull up the, 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 uh, the weeds, amen? It's not my job to pull up the tares. It's my job to do my job. Discerning truth in a time of deception. We live in a time today of deception, folks, but you can know what's right. You can know what's true. Look for the fruit. Is it the fruit of the Spirit that you see? Is godliness what you see? Do you see people trying to do things the way God said to do it? Is the Spirit bearing witness with your spirit that this is of God? Hello now. Would you stand with me this afternoon?